So our next storyteller is Liz Gulovich. And I know Liz personally for a while because she's in my partner Sally's book group. And when I'm really lucky, Sally brings home some of the food from Liz's house. <laughs> she's an amazing uh, cook of Greek food. Uh, but she also, she is a retired dentist. She uh, has three kids and, um, wait a minute, did I get that wrong? Right. Right, and um, she's a permanent student, still taking classes online, attending performances at Stanford. And uh, she is going to tell you today about an amazing chapter in her mother's life. Here's Liz. I'm going to tell you the story about my mother. My mother was born in 1902 in uh, Semendri, Turkey. She was in, uh, lived in a farming village, and she was Greek. She spoke only Turkish, and she was never educated because she was a girl, and she was poor. Um, the uh, when I was young, I always wondered how we were Greek, and my mother only spoke Turkish with, and was born in Turkey. And so I asked her one day, how is it that we're Greek? And, she, and I asked her, how long did our relatives live in your village? And she said, our people were from there for as long as she could remember, going many, many uh, times back. And so for hundreds of years, the Greeks and the Turks lived together there. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, the Sultan did not like the uh, minorities in his country. So he began to kill the Armenians and the Greeks. In my mother's village, the people had underground hiding spots where they would hide when the soldiers were nearby. My mother told us the story that one day she was out walking and the mayor of the town galloped up to her on his horse and said, what are you doing out here? Hurry, the soldiers are nearby and grabbed her on his horse and took her to the hiding place. The Turks in that town helped my mother very much. We go to 1913 and my grandfather went to America because he wanted to avoid conscription because of the situation going on in Turkey. And he also wanted to earn some money. My mother lived in the village uh, with her mother and her grandmother. And my mother's mother died, and then her grandmother died, and she was left an orphan in this village uh, to take care of her uh, five-year-old brother when she was 12. And uh, she did this, but she had to have help, and the Turkish women helped her. They gave her food and shelter, but what she remembers most about this experience was that she was always hungry. Uh, when the war ended in 1917, her father came back to Turkey, uh, to Constantinople, and sent money back to the village for her brother and her to join him, uh, uh, to live with him. And uh, they lived a happy life for two and a half years there. But in 1920, uh, he told her that he was going to arrange a marriage for her. She was 17 and a half, and she had no say. And so he arranged a marriage to another man from her village, but it was someone she barely knew. So she had to leave. Uh, two months later, they went to uh, America, and she had to leave everything she knew and loved and go with a stranger to America. In America, the Greeks from that village all settled in and around the Detroit area. Um, they were Greeks, they knew how to cook, they knew food, so they started restaurants and grocery stores. My father's first job was a business that he started. He bought a push cart. And on the push cart, he put on sandwiches and candies and sodas and cigarettes and pushed it out in front of Ford Motor waiting for the workers to come out for lunch. And so they bought his wares, and that was a successful business for him. And he was able to save enough money to buy a house. 
they bought the house and they had to take in boarders. They had eight boarders that my mother had to take care of with her young family while my father then got a job as a dishwasher. Well, the family struggled in America because it was a hard time in America. By 1938, however, they became middle class and they owned a car, their own house, and they had the most successful restaurant that they ever had. But they still worked really hard. My mother and dad got up at five in the morning to go to the restaurant and they uh, opened the restaurant and then they, my dad cooked, my mother washed the dishes, they served breakfast and lunch and waited for my sisters to come in at 3.30. My sisters then took over and worked the restaurant until two and then had an hour to clean it up for my mother and dad to come back. So for seven days a week, they worked 10 to 12 hours. Now this was supposed to be a story about my mother's independence. So I'm going to, I tell, told you how hard it was for them in uh, America and in the village. In 1971, my father died and my mother came out to live with us. And my mother said to me one day, she said, um, I wish I could vote before I die. And I said, well, mom, you can if you uh, go to school and learn a little bit uh, of how to read and write and maybe sign your name. And I said, would you be willing to do that? And she said, yes, she would. So I looked for a class, and the only thing I could find was English as a second language given at Palo Alto High School at night. So I signed her up for that. And the first night of school, we held hands and walked up the sidewalk to the old main building. And my mother was sweating and hyperventilating like I am right now. <laughs> and. Uh, I took her into the classroom and um, talked to the teacher and introduced my mom and told her why she wanted to learn desperately to read and write so she could vote. And the teacher, whose name was Pat Saunders, said, don't worry, I'll look after her. So she did her English as a second language, but she set my mother aside and taught her her ABCs and how to read and write a little bit and to sign her name. And my mother did this for two years. And after that, I registered her to vote. So the first uh, time we voted, we went up to the Lucille Nixon Elementary School. And uh, you had to sign in. So I signed in. And my mother needed extra time to sign her name. I went in and vote. When I came out, my mother was able to come into a booth with me. And we picked up the stylus. And I said to her, now, who do you want for president? And she'd say the name, and we'd punch the ballot. And who do you want for senator? And we'd punch the ballot. And when we were done, we came out, and all the volunteers uh, at the polling station applauded because they knew it was the first time she had ever voted. And someone came up and put a sticker on her and said, I voted. And she was smiling from ear to ear, and we practically skipped home. Uh, in a night, she was, by the way, uh, 73 at the time that she did this. When she was in her 80s, my husband and I bought her a condominium in Palo Alto. She had never lived on her own or made decisions for herself ever. And this little bit of reading and writing allowed her to take care of her life. I opened a checking account for her and a credit card account for her and got her a little senior bus ta uh, pass. She was able to go to the senior center. She was able to get a little money from the bank to go shopping and take her empty prescription bottles over to Long's to refill them. Now this was an incredible achievement for someone who came from that small village hiding in a cave. And she loved having that independence. And one day I said to her, Mom, how do you feel now that you're in your 80s and you're living on your own in your, in your uh, house? And she said, you know, when I was a little girl, uh, there was a lady in our village that told my fortune. And she said, you know, you're going to have a hard and long life. But in the end, it's going to be a very good life for you. And she said, my fortune came true. Now, when I was telling Elliot my story, and I told him about Pat Saunders. He said, Pat Saunders? I know Pat Saunders. 
my boys went to school with her. So she's somewhere here in the audience. I haven't seen her since the 70s. Where is she? Please stand up. She's, she is so responsible for making my mother's life a wonderful. Thank you very much. Very nice.